Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all in the inaugural Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Lecture 2022. The lecture is being organized by the Center for Diaspora Studies, Punjabi University. To deliver the inaugural Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Lecture, we have with us Professor Gurharpal Singh Ji. The title of his lecture today is Rethinking the Sikh Diaspora in the 21st Century. We, are all, we also have Professor Vern A. Dezenbury with us, who has worked uh, with Dr. Tatla in Close Association for a long time, and who is our guest of honor for today's inaugural lecture. And we are honored to have Rajvan Tatla ji, Dr. Tatla's son, as a special guest with us. I welcome Professor Gurharpal Singh ji, Professor Vern A. Dezenbury, and Rajvan Tatla ji. I also welcome Professor Arvind, Vice Chancellor, Punjabi University, Professor Gurmukh Singh, Director, Center for Diaspora Studies, Punjabi University, and all our listeners. Now, I would request Professor Gurmukh to formally welcome all our guests and briefly introduce Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Lecture. Professor Gurmukh. Uh, thanks, Tamjit. Uh, first of all, I would like to formally welcome Professor Gurharpal Singh Ji, Professor Dezenbury, our worthy Vice Chancellor, Professor Arvind and Rajvan Tatlaji. We are honored to have Professor Gurharpal Singhji with us, who very kindly gave his consent to deliver the inaugural Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Lecture. Professor Gurharpal Ji is one of those very few important scholars of Punjab origin who have done remarkable work sitting in Western academic space. Professor Gurur Pal Singh is a political scientist and emeritus professor of Sikh and Punjab studies, SWAS, University of London. He was also the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities from 2011 to 2017. He was the inaugural holder of the Nader Dean Shah Chair in the School of Philosophy, Theology and Religion at the University of Birmingham and C.R. Parekh Chair in Indian Politics at the University of Hull. Main areas of his research are more modern politics of South Asia, Sikh and Punjab studies, multiculturalism with special reference to the city of Leicester, the partition of India, religion and development. His recent book, Sikh Nationalism from a Dominant Minority to an Ethno-Religious Diaspora has received much praise in academic circles. With these few words, I once again welcome Professor Gurhar Pal Singh. I also welcome and thank Professor Vern A. Dozen very far sparing time from his busy schedule to be with us. Professor Dozen very is Emeritus Professor, Department of Anthropology, Hamline University, a longtime intellectual collaborator and companion of Dr. Tatla. Professor Dozen very has done commendable work in the field of Sikh religion and diaspora. Professor Dazanbari's role was instrumental in the establishment of Punjab Center for Migration Studies at Lyalpur Khalsa College, Jalantar. I welcome you, Professor Dazanbari. I welcome and thank Professor Arvind, Vice Chancellor, Punjabi University Patiala for taking time out to be with us for the inaugural Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Lecture. I also welcome Rajman Tatla Ji, Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla's son, who has very kindly agreed to be with us. I would like to share with you that the present Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Lecture was instituted to carry forward the intellectual legacy of Dr. Tatla, his dedication and commitment to scholarship and dialogue in the 20, 21st century. His contribution to Sikh diaspora and Punjab studies has been of immense significance for a whole generation of scholars. Dr. Tatla had an exceptional sense of belongingness to Punjab, its land, language, and culture. His personality was a prime example of committed scholarship. And then I want to thank Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Trust for their support in organizing uh, this lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Professor Gurmukh. Now I would request uh, Professor Arvind to give his uh, introductory remarks. Professor Arvind. Uh, yeah, so there are several threads that we have in diaspora related activities and one of the problem yeah, it goes down the input mic volume anyway there is some technical issue uh, i keep adjusting it you just keep telling me when it goes down fine sir uh, yeah so the research thread the diaspora activity needs to be kind of strengthened 
and uh, to strengthen any research thread because research is a somewhat slow process. I mean, that's why you see the research cultures. Uh, the Currently, the political timescales are four years in some countries, five years in other countries. That is not the time scale over which generation of knowledge or research happens. So therefore, in academia, people who are wanting to keep research direction alive, for example, we would like the uh, diaspora research direction to remain alive, one has to keep connecting with people who have done important work in that area. So I see the um, continuation of these uh, Professor Tatla Memorial Lecture and the lecture series an effort in that direction because he did con contribute in this area in a very significant way. And we must keep remembering and connecting with such work so that we can continue on the research directions. So therefore, it's a very welcome thing that we are moving in this direction. Uh, Professor Gurur Pal Singh is the right person to uh, give the first lecture in this series. On the lighter vein, I would say that uh, if you meet him, he could be from any part of the world. And that tells you that uh, from the looks of him, I mean, you cannot make out which part of the world he comes from, which country he comes from. And that's my own personal theory that humans have been intermingling very strongly, much more than what we think that they have been. There is also DNA-based argument about this, that uh, we believe uh, in kind of purity of races and segregation and this, that, and so on. But humans have been mixing and developing themselves as a community. And that also is important for diaspora studies because this whole idea of migration and going to another place is nothing very new. It has always been happening. And uh, Professor Dazenbury, as he has already contributed in this direction in a big way, uh, and his presence today as the guest of honor and his remarks, uh, we would really appreciate what he has to say. Uh, Punjabi University, since uh, it's a uh, one of the major universities of Punjab and of India. And Punjab is in some sense a hub, hub of migration in various ways. So I think documenting and doing diaspora studies at Punjabi University and connecting with the Punjabi and Indian diaspora all over the world is something that we should do very strongly. So with these remarks, I congratulate uh, Professor Gurmuk Singh and uh, Professor Taramjeet for putting together these series of programs which so far we have been doing zero budget. If uh, we receive certain amount from the Tatla Memorial Trust, we will utilize it for the diaspora activities and for the propagation of research uh, on diaspora. So with these words, I, mm, would, I'm happy to participate in this lecture today. Today I have some time and I will try to listen to as much of the lecture as I can. And in the end, if I wish to say something, I will message Dharamjit and I will come back again to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Arvind. Uh, I would uh, now request our guest of honor for today, Professor Vern Dusenbury, to say a few words about uh, his experiences of working with the Dr. Tatla, uh, Professor Dusenbury. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Gurmukh Singh and Dr. Dharamjeet Singh for organizing this event and for securing Professor Gurharpal Singh as the inaugural Darshan Singh Tatla lecturer. I thank the vice chancellor for gracing us with his presence and his wise words. And I'd like to express my deep appreciation to the organizers for inviting me to participate. It's been over a year since the field of Sikh and Punjab studies lost one of its leading lights, Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla. Many of us who were his friends and collaborators and frequent interlocutors miss him immensely. But everyone in the field of Sikh and Punjab studies is poorer by his absence. Darshan was an iconoclastic scholar with a peripatetic career. Born in Barwal Kalan village in Ludhiana district in 1947, he attended local government schools before eventually receiving a BA in economics from Punjabi University, Patiala. In the early 1970s, he left for the UK to pursue first an MA in economics from Cambridge University and subsequently a master's degree in economics from the University of Birmingham and a PhD in sociology from Warwick University. A revised version of Darshan's PhD dissertation was subsequently published in 1999 in the UK and the USA 
as The Sick Diaspora, The Search for Statehood. The book became an instant touchstone in Sikh diaspora studies and a taking off point for much subsequent theorizing and empirical research, including, as I expect we'll hear today, much of, more from Gerhard Paul's comments. Darshan never held a regular academic teaching position, but he was instrumental in the development of Punjab studies in the UK as co-founder of the Punjab Research Group and the International Journal of Punjab Studies. And over the years, he held visiting research fellow positions at a number of institutions in England and Punjab, including here at Punjabi University. Darshan Tatla was the bibliographer and archivist of the Sikh diaspora, collecting, sharing, publishing information on Sikhs and materials produced by Sikhs in the UK, North America, and around the world. Those of us new to the field of Sikh diaspora studies found Darshan was the go-to person for research materials and for professional contacts. Darshan was also a generous scholar, readily willing to give both emerging and established colleagues feedback, support, and encouragement on their research proposals and their working projects. And he was willing to give his time to collaborate with a wide range of scholars from a variety of disciplines on a diverse set of projects. Indeed, both Gerhard Paul and I were beneficiaries of such collaborations with Darshan. In the mid-1990s, Darshan returned to Punjab, hoping to find a permanent academic home. Instead, he found himself creating new institutions and revitalizing existing ones. From 2003 to 2008, Darshan was the founding director of the Punjab Center of Diaspora Studies at Lyalpur Khalsa College in Jalandhar. From 2012 to 17, he served as a research fellow in the Department of Punjab Historical St Studies at Punjabi University, and while well, there, contributed to the work of the Center for Diaspora Studies. In 2018-19, while serving as a fellow of the World Punjabi Center in Patiala, he mounted a public exhibit on the Sikh diaspora. And in the last year of his life, the SGPC announced that Darshan would be the founding director of a new Sikh diaspora museum and archives to be housed at the Torah Institute for Advanced Sikh Studies near Patiala. That opportunity, had he been able to take it up, would have been a most fitting culmination of Darshan's life work. Darshan Tatla loved Punjab and cared deeply about the global Sikh comb. And for his work on the Sikh diaspora in 2017, Darshan received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Dr. Jasbir Singh Sani Endowed Chair of Sikh and Punjabi Studies at the University of California, Riverside. Despite this accolade, in an obituary written for the journal Sikh Formations, Gurhar Paul was probably correct in calling Darshan Tatla quote, an unsung hero. However, since his death, there's been a chorus of voices from scholars, junior and senior, male and female, Punjabi and non-Punjabi, singing their praises for Darshan Tatla and his influence on their lives and on their work. In March 2020, before he returned to England for the last time, Darshan was able to register the Darshan Singh Tatla Trust Punjab. One of the objective of the trust was, quote, to sustain the scholarly agenda of Dr. Darshan S. Tatla. This inaugural lecture and the ones to follow over the next four years are one way that the trust and Darshan's family hope to sustain Darshan's legacy of service to Punjab and to Sikh studies and to the global Sikh poem. And now let me turn things over to the organizers to introduce our distinguished speaker, Darshan's longtime friend and colleague, Professor Gerhard Paul Singh. Thank you, uh, Professor Dizenbury. Uh, I would now request uh, Professor Gurhar Paul Ji to deliver the inaugural Dr. Dashan Singh Tatla Memorial Lecture 2022. Professor Gurhar Paul Ji. Thank you um, for the introduction um, by um, Professor Gurmukh Singh, um, yourself, um, Vern. And, and Vice Chancellor. 
Um, I am deeply honored to give this first memorial lecture. Um, I was in Patiala, as I said, in February 2020, and I hope I will have the opportunity to be with you in the near future. The lecture today um, is a timely moment to reflect on Darshan, his work, and his life. Purely coincidentally, I am speaking to you from the city of Leicester, which is in the global spotlight because of events that have happened in the last two weeks. And not least, they concern elements of the Indian diaspora. My task is to reflect on Darshan's work, how it helps us to think about the Sikh diaspora in current times and the challenges ahead. I will do so with the help of a PowerPoint uh, to which I will turn shortly. The first part of the lecture is about Darshan, the man and his work. Um, some of it, this has already been said by Vern, but I will repeat it. The second is on the subject of Sikh and diaspora studies and how this has developed in the last two decades. In the third part, I will reflect on um, the recent publication by Darshan's supervisor, Professor Robin Coyne of Oxford University um, and his work and his book, um, The Global Diasporas and its implications for the Sikh case. And finally, I will look at some of the challenges ahead. The lecture I will like to add is an overview. Um, it is not um, a thesis on a singular subject. So it's the general perspective. And I apologize here for no doubt there will be many uh, omissions uh, and oversights on my part, but this is, in a sense, part of the um, costs of doing the kind of uh, presentation that I'm going to do. So I, I will share with you now the um, slides. Um, slide one. So before uh, beginning is useful to have some background about Darshan. Vern has already spoken of um, Darshan and his background, but it's interesting uh, what he has said, that Darshan passed away last year, and we, um, his friends and the academic community are still coming to terms with a loss. Um, for me personally, one of the reasons why I was unable to give this lecture was that I was, I, I could not really make sense of his departure and indeed in a very short time reflect on what he had done. Darshan was a distinguished scholar, a close friend and co-author. And I still remember to this day, one of the first um, articles that I published um, after getting my PhD on the Punjabi press uh, with Darshan in 1989. And it was um, a very interesting experience, but also an exhilarating um, time to see one's own name in publication. Darshan, as has been said, was educated at the universities of Patiala, Cambridge, Birmingham, and Warwick, and he was one of the key moving spirits in 1984 when many of us felt that there needed to be some serious academic research on the Punjab, um, in, and as a result of which he helped to set up the um, Punjab Research Group. And interestingly, when we set the, the group up, the aim was to reflect on what we collectively um, considered were the three Punjabs, the historical Punjab, 
um, the divided Punjabs east and west and the Punjabi diaspora. So much before the current interest in diasporas and diaspora studies, our aim was to integrate the study of Punjab as a one unit, um, regardless of its constituent parts. The Punjab Research Group under Darshan's inspiration was prolific in producing research papers that laid the foundations of the journal, International Journal of Punjab Studies. He was also very much committed to the subsequent offshoot from that journal, Sikh Formations, um, that was launched in 2005. Overall, what characterized Darshan's um, outlook and position was his commitment to Punjab, Punjab and Sikh studies and diaspora studies. Uh, he was kind and helpful to others, especially younger scholars. As Vern has already said in an appreciation note on him after his passing, I described Darshan as an unsung, unsung hero who contribute, whose contribution to Sikh and Punjab studies was and probably will remain unmatched. Yet sadly, this, this is now better recognized than was the case during his lifetime. I do very much hope that in subsequent lectures in this series, the contributors reflect not only on diaspora studies, but also focus in on an evaluation of Darshan's own work and contribution. So to begin with, Darshan's key focus was the research on the diaspora. Interestingly, he was both the object and the subject of his research. He left India in 1974, and in the early 90s, when I first met him in 1982, he was beginning his research. Um, again, as been, has been mentioned, um, this initial research um, was focused on what is compiling um, bibliographies of the materials that had been published on Punjabis overseas. This was an important exercise because it created the basis of then his research, which was on the Sikh diaspora at the University of Warwick. This was, as Van has said, this was completed in 1994 and published in 1999 as a monograph. And it soon became the text on the subject at a time when there was great interest in diasporas and diaspora studies. Darshan's interest in diasporas continued. Um, we collaborated on a joint work, um, Sikhs in Britain. Um, by this time, Darshan had left for India and I can still remember the trying efforts of this collaboration and trying to communicate with him when he was in India. But in the end, the volume was completed. And again, it remains the text on the Sikh community in Britain. Subsequently, with Van, he produced, it, produced um, a timely volume on Sikh diaspora philanthropy in Punjab Global Giving for Local Good, um, published by Oxford University Press. Um, this is a very interesting work um, and was extremely helpful to myself at a, at a time when I was leading a project on religions and development um, at the University of Birmingham. In addition to these outputs, Darshan has published a large number of edited volumes, 
contributed articles to the press, um, to um, chapters in volumes, and established the Center for Migration Studies at Lyleport Castle College, and of course has had the continued association with you um, at the University of Patiala and the Center for Diaspora Studies. Now, I want to move on to reflect on the Darshan's uh, first monograph, the Sikh diaspora. This remains the work in, in which will probably define him um, and, his, um, and his intellectual output. It's important to say some things about this work, uh, what it was and how it mapped out the agenda on the Sikh diaspora um, when it was written. The work needs to be placed in its context um, and arose against the background of the early 19, late 1980s and early 1990s that were characterized by the end of the Cold War, um, the efforts by the US to establish a new world order uh, with the promotion of neoliberalism and, and the early phase of globalization. This was inevitably followed by new interests in new agents and um, groups uh, which became active, um, namely diaspora communities that were evident in the increasing ethnic conflicts uh, which gripped the former Soviet Union and the countries of Eastern Europe. The, the interest was also um, stimulated by what Robin Coyne has called interstitial spaces between home and exile, as reflected in the politics of minority ethnic communities in the West. And of course, um, there was in the Punjab a decade of militancy after 1984, which cost nearly 30,000 lives um, and, would, and um, cast a deep shadow over the uh, future of the state. These macro global and regional developments were accompanied by new methodological departures. For example, the rise of post-structuralism and the death of the grand narrative um, as, as illustrated by the work for, of Arjun Apadroy and his student, Brian Axel, who focused on the Sikh diaspora in the West as primarily a Western concern in his um, book, The Tortured Body. And then there was the work of um, this, the great scholar of nationalism, Benedict Anderson, and his volume, Long Distance Nationalism, which popularized the idea that diasporas could be the site of nation, uh, na of nation building and nationalism as an ideology. These um, background developments um, and, and the growth of the literature um, on diasporas was brought together by Robin Coeney's volume, Global Diasporas, that caught the spirit of the age in 1997. This in a sense was the overall, uh, the takeoff phase of diaspora studies um, in the West. Now, what is the key argument of the Sikh diaspora? What was novel about what Darshan uh, wrote and what he said. The work, if it, people still read it, is very rich in detail. Um, it's an empirical study and it draws extensively on community um, Punjabi sources, as well as official, secondary and other materials. Um, in a review uh, that I did and of which I will speak a bit more, 
I described it as a first serious attempt at writing the history of the Sikh community in the West. Um, the volume in its structure um, goes through the history and the um, settlement of Sikhs abroad, their organizations, diaspora links um, with Punjab, um, then the rise of the separatist movement in UK um, and North America, and the impact of the Sikh diaspora um, thereafter on interstate relations, especially between India, UK, US, and Canada. The way Darshan framed his argument was very similar to the conventional approach to the diaspora. Namely, he described the Sikhs as a, or the Sikh diaspora as a victim diaspora created by a critical event. The critical event um, was, of course, 1984. Um, and this, according to him, led to the interplay of culture, group consciousness, and, and uncertainties about migrant status in the host country and set off complex attachments towards an imaginary homeland. This development, in a sense, accelerated um, the emergence of overseas Sikh communities as a distinct, visible, and identif identifiable diaspora without the traditional association with India and other Indians. So in, in some, um, the argument that Darshan was making was essentially that 1984 was, a, was a, the dramatic event which gave rise to the creation of a diasporic consciousness, a separateness followed by a pursuit of um, an imaginary homeland, a separate imaginary homeland. Now, when the work was published, interestingly, um, it was sent to me to review, and I ended up reviewing it in three or four journals. I, I can't really remember at the moment. But the most substantive review that I did uh, was in the Journal of Diaspora Studies. And in that review, I recognized the work that Darshan had done, but at the same time, hi highlighted my own concerns about the argument that had been advanced. So firstly, I argued that I, did, I could not um, agree with this proposition that um, Sikh nationalism was na a nationalism in the making uh, after 1947, and that it was 1984, the critical event, which triggered um, um, its um, completion, or rather realization, and then um, the pursuit of a separate state by the Sikh diaspora. I have argued um, in my latest publication on Sikh nationalism um, with Giorgio Shani that this reading of Sikh history is largely ahistorical and that to understand the rise of Sikh nationalism, um, we need to go back to the late 19th um, century when the three major communities of the Punjab um, Hindus, uh, Muslims, and the Sikhs went through a similar process of communal mobilization, stroke, religious nationalism um, that culminated in 1947. Secondly, I also argued that the large number of exchanges, principally between the diaspora and the Punjab, um, of religious, political, economic, and social nature, that these were very poorly understood and largely unmapped. This is something I, I will come back to later in the lecture. And 
I also um, contested his proposition that the diaspora was independent um, of the Punjab um, and India, and that the diaspora was rather contrary, was dependent, um, very much dependent, um, and should be seen as, as through the metaphor of a weather vane rather than an independent agent. Furthermore, um, there were complex arguments, which I won't go into, regarding how multiculturalism in the West had fostered Sikh separatism um, and how underlying um, the, the emergence of the diaspora were elements of the Gadar syndrome, namely um, the experience of racism uh, of community of sea communities in the West and their search for a safe home um, where they could find refuge. Perhaps most important of all was I felt that the argument that was being made in the Sikh diaspora would not be able to explain the rise and fall um, of separatism in the diaspora itself. And this in the end um, happened to be the case is that much as the militancy in, faded in the Punjab, so likewise the saliency of the diaspora, in, uh, of the militants in the diaspora also um, faded too. So overall, I argued um, in my review, which was um, rather critical and I'm not sure how Darshan took it at the time, Overall, I argue that there was a kind of unique combination of the new methodologies uh, and Darshan's research, which complemented each other. However, they did not appear to provide um, any realistic understanding of how overseas Sikh communities um, interacted with Punjab and India and their actual relationship. So this has been and remains uh, my refrain um, on the take of the, the diaspora Sikhs as being driven by a separate agenda. Now, since um, the uh, publication of uh, uh, Darshan's work, in the last two decades, uh, we have seen a massive increase of uh, growth in the um, literature um, on, on diaspora studies and on Sikh diaspora in particular. This literature um, is marked by both depth and range um, and includes um, and, and includes many areas and these are I have listed in, in, in the PowerPoint uh, to which I'm speaking at the moment. There are many reasons for, for this um, uh, development, including that there are um, far more uh, Sikhs and non-Sikhs in um, higher institutes of higher education in the West. Um, and the growth of Sikh studies uh, as a subject in North America, um, illustrated by the creation of new chairs of Sikh studies. The areas of, and, and the range of, of growth um, is, is really quite immense. And, and I just would like to mention one or two uh, one of the areas that has been very popular is a field of cultural studies, where there has been a heavy emphasis on consumption, behavior, art, and music. Um, with reference to music, one can see, for example, the huge impact on youth culture that popular music associated with the Bhangra scene has had, not only here in the West, um, but its importation in into India through Bollywood and then recycling of that to the diaspora. So there's been a 
a huge increase in, 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 in the output on, on the Sikh diaspora. And this has been accompanied by um, policy interest in fields like uh, diaspora and development, um, international relations, most recently, the uh, concerns about migration from Punjab and ref those seeking refugee status. And of course, not, not to forget how the digital world is reshaping diaspora and diaspora studies itself. So overall, there's been an enormous increase in the field of subjects studied and the range of subjects. Um, but this depth is not, however, always accompanied by an understanding that gives us an overview of what's actually happening in the diaspora. Far too often, there are very broad generalizations based, made on the basis of very small sample sizes. We really, I feel, need to get a grip and an overview of the subject. Now, in this slide, um, I have highlighted some of the concerns that I think, uh, or the gaps that remain in the study of the Sikh diaspora, and I will then go on to talk about it um, in, in much more detail. First and foremost, um, those who write and work on the diaspora rarely um, quite define what the Sikh diaspora is. Um, it's almost taken as a given, and the question of boundaries regarding the Sikh faith posed in um, Hugh MacLeod's famous question, who is a Sikh, uh, still needs to be addressed, um, even if, um, if it is then further developed, and, and however it is developed. Secondly, the issue of what the relationship of the Sikh diaspora is with other diasporas, for example, Punjabi, South Asian, um, and um, um, other community diasporas, um, and how that relationship has changed over time. Um, this um, it is, is rarely um, um, addressed directly. And even in, in the works of Darshan, there, there is some um, ambiguity and how this is problematized. Thirdly, um, framing of the diaspora. How can we describe the Sikh diaspora as purely a victim diaspora? Or, or is it, and it has strong elements of this, or is it a labor diaspora? Uh, or is it, as some have suggested, um, increasingly becoming a deterritorialized di diaspora with little, if any, linkages to the homeland. So this raises a conceptual question of whether we should have one, um, two, or combined or several typologies to define and frame the Sikh diaspora. And what does this entail um, if we do? Um, also, we, despite the great research which is, has been done, we have limited understanding of the size of the diaspora um, and its composition in the host communities. Uh, there's a great deal of information out there, and I will talk about that um, later on. To, uh, to the three other areas I think uh, we need to address are the relations with the homeland, relations in the hostlands, and the overall com, um, issue of complexity, both internal um, within Sikhs themselves and, and externally. Okay, um, now I've raised, excuse me, I'm just going to have a drink of water. I'm, my throat is drying. I've raised the various issues that need to be um, addressed and how and, or, or is this kind of research at all possible? 
Um, and one might say that given the variety of um, and, and differences in methodological approaches that now exist, um, it, it's, it's trying to get an overview is, is, is a forlorn task that one should rather give up and focus on, on small areas that one can manage. Well, I, I think there is a way out, and the way out is, again, um, in the work of Robin Cohen and his latest book, Global Diasporas, um, an introduction, which is the third edition of the original volume. And in this work, Robin, um, Professor Cohen combines um, what I see as Weberian um, sociology that is constructing uh, ideal types of diasporas um, with strong community histories. And, and it's important in how he defines a diaspora. He defines a diaspora as members of a defined group who have been dispersed to diff... Uh, sorry, I, I, I cannot see... There. Members of, of defined groups who have been dispersed to many destinations, they construct a shared identity, they still orientate themselves to an original home, and then they demonstrate an affinity with other members of groups dispersed to other spaces. Um, Alongside this definition, he also emphasizes the need to recognize history, formation, birth, rebirth, development, construction, proliferation activities of the diaspora. And perhaps most importantly, um, Professor Cohen emphasizes centrality of a homeland. The acute sense of longing, the anguish of loss and dispossession, and the melancholic memories that are at the heart of the diaspora condition. Um, so th the homeland is in a way central to his definition um, of a diaspora. It, the diaspora exists in antithesis to the, the homeland. It is not some kind of rootless um, um, entity. Now, in this volume, interestingly, um, Professor Cohen devotes uh, one chapter to the case of the Sikhs who are compared to um, the um, Zionist who created Israel. And here, um, some of his observations are worth uh, looking at. Um, he describes the Sikhs as having special attachment to the Punjab without the association being termed as theocratic. And drawing on our volume, sorry, drawing on our during on our volume um, Sikh nationalism, he describes the uh, Sikhs as a nation without a state with an ethno-religious diaspora. And interestingly, he makes um, two observations um, which are worth reflecting on, that the search for the separate statehood um, seems to be a lost cause. Um, and, and that namely the Khalistanis have boarded the historical train too late. Moreover, in their efforts to create a separate Sikh state, they are trying to imprison the butterfly um, ethnic identity into too small a net with a too dense a mesh. Um, of course, these um, observations um, would be contested, um, but they are important um, insofar as they are coming from the, probably one of the eminent authorities on the study of diasporas um, in the West. Now, 
I've, briefly, I know I probably have gone um, overboard. Um, I will go through some of the areas um, that I think that need further research um, um, and, and more detailed research. Um, I think, um, as I said previously in my critique of Darshan, that I, had, I was a bit doubtful um, that the Sikh diaspora as a global identity um, existed. Um, now, since the 1990s, I think the, this consciousness um, has strengthened, strengthened as a result of um, um, new technologies, new communication technologies, media technologies, and globalization itself. And it's evident in the campaigns, for example, turban campaigns, um, identity campaigns, and responses to victimization um, in countries far apart as Afghanistan, um, UK, um, and Canada. And also evident in um, homeland concerns, um, as we saw recently over the farmers' agitation and COVID-19. There is um, a, a strong uh, sense of um, common identity, common religious symbols, and um, construction of what one might call a common communal history, um, however that is interpreted. This consciousness um, of Sikhs as a global community um, certainly is far more pronounced and exists today um, and is, is perhaps worthy of much more um, detailed analysis. Vernon in his uh, comments um, use the term uh, uh, global Sikh calm. Um, and I think I'm um, reflecting on the use of that term to perhaps articulate a sense of global consciousness um, that exists. The second area um, of, of research, um, I think, using Professor Cohen's work that we can focus in on much more is this sense of the homeland, the relationship with the homeland. It seems to me that today that you know there are three clear separate um, um, narratives here. One which is articulated mostly from India that sees the diaspora as a site of separatist politics. Um, and, and that is, um, you know, quite common uh, and has been there since the early 1980s. Um, the second is, is that the diaspora is part of the broader um, Indian diaspora, Punjabi diaspora, South Asian diaspora, or even, dare one might say it, in the way uh, the diaspora has been constructed from India uh, um, of overseas Indians a Hindu diaspora. And thirdly, um, perhaps um, not as, um, as important, um, you know, as significant as, as the other two narratives, is there are reflections on this idea of a global com um, that I've mentioned previously, that Sikhs are emerging as a global community who are being connected together um, by, um, recent new developments, both the sense of consciousness as a global community, but also um, as a result of communication technologies. Now, the, the, what, what I sense in the work of Darshan, as, as I first commented in 1999 when I reviewed his book, is that he was very ambivalent on um, going whole hog to argue that the diaspora was an independent agent. Um, in 2009, he wrote, I, and I think this is, is, is either from Verne's volume or elsewhere, that there were complex web of relationships between the diaspora and the Punjab, and that these were ongoing in a process of mutual dependence. So he had in a way moved from the position of autonomy of the diaspora to mutual dependence. 
But I think, you know, these, these kind of comments remain assertions which are not backed up by much empirical research. Um, so what are the what is the nature of these um, um, uh, dependent relationships? What's their size and how have they changed? Um, and this then what you know will it enable us to answer better the question whether the diaspora is independent, mutually dependent, or dependent. And I, and I think this is a very important question in the whole of the Sikh diaspora debate. Um, and we, um, in, in our book, in reviewing the literature, still say the diaspora is quite heavily dependent on events from South Asia. Um, and we say that partly because of, of a very conservative judgment about the, 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 the nature and composition of the diaspora itself. And I'll, I'll say a few, uh, I'll explain that in a minute. But one important point I want to also emphasize is that given the size of the diaspora, which is about um, 10 to 12% now, the total Sikh population, very few scholars have picked up on the importance of size and how that comparatively has enormous implications for diaspora homeland relations, implications relating to um, uh, notions of um, identity of separateness. And, and there's been significant comparative research on this and, and it needs to be borne in mind. Okay, um, it, in terms of relations in homelands, well, th again, there's, there's a, a lot here that one could go into um, about um, uh, settlement, um, ch the separation and differentiation over time. Uh, and, uh, and as I said previously, the need for more uh, community histories in Canada, USA, UK, and elsewhere. It's important also, I think, to remember the different traditions of integration of migrants within the countries in the West uh, of France, UK, US, Australia, and so forth. And moreover, to remember the experience of you know, what to reflect on the experience of Sikhs in the global South. One must not uh, forget there are a large number of Sikhs or have been historically in the Gulf states, uh, in Southeast Asia and, and in Africa. And, and more recently research is showing there are some also in Latin America. Um, then, Alongside some of these issues, I think there are more recent developments that we need to take on board um, of how the um, overall frameworks within Western countries of managing minorities are now under threat and, and are changing. And alongside that, the enormous social change which is occurring within the diaspora. Um, I think some of these points that I've highlighted here are, are common knowledge, but what I would like to say is that we really do not have uh, a social image of the diaspora. It's its social composition in terms of its uh, class, um, employment profile, um, and, um, um, and living um, uh, um, um, uh, economy and life within the diaspora as such. Um, there, there is often a great, um, um, you know, song and dance made about the uh, wealth of the diaspora, but we must not forget the social base of the diaspora um, by and large is relatively low, uh, um, drawn mainly from the agriculture uh, community, agricultural communities, and, and it's, it's only um, three or four generation based in the largest, in, in the oldest settled communities. Moreover, we are continuing to 
get large increases in the um, sick, dies, uh, sick population overseas, primary migration, um, as we see in countries like Canada, USA, Australia, and Italy. And, and even in countries like the UK, which have now have strict migration controls, but informal channels continue to provide um, uh, um, um, huge migration. So it is in this context that we argued um, in our book on Sikh nationalism that um, it's perhaps too premature at the moment to suggest that the Sikh diaspora is an independent agent, a category that it, it certainly has a potential to become so um, if the migration flows continue and the social composition of the diaspora changes. But at the, but at the moment, it's not, um, it's probably uh, unrealistic to say that it's the driving agent uh, for a distinct kind of identity uh, and politics. Okay, and, and finally, I, I just add um, the issue of complexity. Uh, I've highlighted this in terms of internal complexity um, within the Sikh community, the sub-Sikh identities that exist uh, alongside caste, language, and ethnicity, and other differences in hostland, as well as external complexities um, that we are only too aware of, of social complexities of fragmentation and uh, the impact of globalization in the last um, two or three decades. Um, yet these complexities are view often and viewed as uh, barriers to creating a general picture about the Sikh diaspora. Um, I'd like to suggest that, um, on the contrary, Robin Cohen's Global Diasporas um, and our own work on Sikh nationalism suggest that um, you can find a pathways through complexities to project, uh, to attempt to make an overall sense of a, a, a community um, that is not very large by comparative standards as a diaspora. So in that sense, um, I think the exercise is doable uh, and requires a great deal of commitment and energy. Okay, uh, I've taken up a lot of time, but I will now um, conclude um, my talk. Um, Darshan, um, in whose honor this lecture is being, presentation lecture is being given, um, as I've said, and many others have said, was passionate about Punjab and the Sikh diaspora. His pioneering work, a uh, landmark work, uh, remains um, uh, an outstanding piece of scholarship, but it must be recognized that it was a product of its time. Um, in this lecture, I've highlighted the developments, developments of the diaspora studies um, and developments within the Sikh diaspora over the last two decades. Um, it's a vast topic. Um, it's a topic that is not uh, increasingly prone to generalizations um, and is now um, studied by various competing methodologies um, which have their own often very narrow and small focus. However, um, it needs to be emphasized um, that we, you know, we can still make sense um, of the subject. We should not forget, as I've said, uh, we are only dealing with about two to three uh, million people. Uh, in total, probably less than 12% of the community. So if Darshan were around today um, and knowing him, I think he would emphasize the following areas for research, the need to reflect on the critical relationship with the homeland, to reflect on 
the serious impact of mass emigration from Punjab that is taking place at a pace is long-term social, economic, cultural, and political consequences for the state. And above all, uh, given the kind of research that he did, um, the need to back research findings with detailed and exhaustive empirical research uh, to produce research findings that are testable and refutable. Uh, these, I believe, were the distinctive qualities of Darshan's scholarship and one that give it a timelessness that will continue to endure and to appeal to generations to come. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Gurharpalji, uh, for uh, presenting a meticulous and a comprehensive take on the history and evolution of uh, the studies of Sikh diaspora and the questions which uh, such knowledge production needs to engage or to address in the 21st century. And uh, I personally liked the reference uh, to the millennials uh, who, as Professor Gurharpal said, uh, belong nowhere, but actually belong everywhere. And it will be really interesting to study their understanding of the diasporic condition and how the millennials relate to the homelands of their parents, which is actually not their homeland. Uh, so this is, this is, this is uh, something that needs to be studied thoroughly and uh, seriously. So thanks to Professor Gurharpalji for such an engaging and comprehensive presentation. I would uh, now request uh, Professor Dusenbury to share his thoughts with us. Uh, thank you, Dharamji. Uh, in my comments for the call channel, in a tribute to him after his passing, I said of Darshan Tatla that, quote, he was a man of strong opinions, but one who, even in the face of intellectual disagreements, could maintain friendships and working relationships across factional, disciplinary, generational, and ideological lines. Dr. Harpal and I have had our intellectual disagreements with Darshan over the years. Yet, as you can see from our comments here today, we both appreciate his scholarly work and professional contributions, and we both valued our long professional friendships with him, personal friendships with him. Darshan would have relished the opportunity to respond to Gerhard Paul's thought-provoking lecture today. Just as he would have eagerly engaged with Gerhard Paul and Giorgio Shani's recent book, Sikh Nationalism, and with Arvind Paul Mundair's recently published book, Violence and the Sikhs. And he surely would have wanted to weigh in on current events affecting Sikh fortune. The farmers movement in India, the new AP government in Punjab, seek victimization in countries of settlement, and so forth. I can't know how Darshan would have responded to today's, le to today's lecture, but I do think that Darshan would have accepted much of the critique Gerhard Paul has made concerning the limitations of his foundational 1999 work. In fact, Darshan was himself involved with and was supporter of the work of many others involved in the new research in Sikh diaspora studies that has come about since the 1990s. And he was actively seeking to fill in many of the gaps in the Sikh diaspora studies that Gerhard Paul has outlined in his lecture. Fundamental to Gerhard Paul's critique of Darson's 1999 work and to other work in Sikh diaspora studies at the time, such as Brian Axel's claim that, quote, the diaspora creates the homeland, was its underplaying of the, quote, centrality of the homeland. And for Gerhard Paul Singh and for Ronald Cohn, the diaspora is dependent upon the homeland, not just as an imagined place of origin, but as a real place linked to the diaspora over time through ongoing exchanges and interactions of various sorts. In the Sikh case, this means that what happens in Punjab and India affects Sikhs living outside Punjab in profound and complex ways. 
as does, of course, what's happening in their countries of residence. But as Gerhard Paul notes, Darshan himself wrote in 2009 of, quote, the complex web of exchanges between the diaspora and Punjab in an ongoing process of mutual dependence. At the time he wrote that, Darshan and I were involved in research on Sikh diaspora philanthropy in Punjab. I think Darshan was quite aware that the diaspora was being affected by what was happening in Punjab, not least the dissipation of the Khalistan movement in the face of state repression, the resulting immiseration of state coffers, stresses on the rural economy, and mass migration from Punjab. But he was also aware of the ways that Punjab was being affected by movements initiated in the diaspora, including diaspora capital being sent to support development projects in Punjab villages. Thus, the issue for both Gurhapal Singh and Darshan Tatla would seem to be actually getting at empirically the rich network of linkages maintained by and the complexities of identities being produced among globally produced dispersed Sikhs. In a 2002 article for Sikh Formations, I wrote of what I took to be a recent discursive move in the field of Sikh studies away from speaking and writing of Sikhs living beyond Punjab as constituting, quote, the Sikh diaspora, to speaking and writing about global Sikhs. As, for example, in the title of the forthcoming edited volume by Upinderji Takar and Doris Jacobish. This latter formulation, Global Six, privileges neither Punjab nor the diaspora as dependent or independent, the spoke or the hub, but invites attention to the nature of that complex network of connections among Sikhs in various locations and to the complex localized identities that have risen among differently positioned Sikhs. I gather from this lecture and from his recent co-authored book on Sikh nationalism that Gerhar Paul might not see this as a satisfactory solution to the definitional and conceptual issues he's identified around the Sikh diaspora. And I agree that Darshan Tatla would not want such a formula to devalue the critical relationship that Sikhs do have with Punjab. After all, Darshan Tatla returned to Punjab to live and he hoped to make Punjab the center for Sikh diaspora studies. That was, in fact, the focus of his work in the latter years of his life. And to that end, I'm certain that Darshan would be delighted at the current dynamism of the Center for Diaspora Studies at Punjabi University under the leadership of Professor Gurmuk Singh and Dr. Dharamjit Singh. And he would have been an eager part of the audience for the recent series of talks emanating from Patiala, but made available globally through the CDS's YouTube channel. So to Gurmukh and Dharamji, let me conclude by wishing you your good work to continue, that there be many more events like this. It is a fitting furtherance of Darshan Tatla's scholarly legacy and his personal dreams. Thank you. And finally, thanks to Gurhar Paul for giving us this inaugural Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Lecture. It was, as always, an honor to share a screen or a podium with you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Dazanbari. Now, I would uh, request uh, Rajvan Tatlaji to share a few words with us. Yeah, sure. Um... I just want to uh, thank you for this event that Delhi University has uh, brought us today and the time taken to organize this seminar. As uh, Vice Chancellor Arvind uh, stated at the start of this lecture, uh, there is much research to do and uh, much work to deliberate on the Sikh diaspora. I applaud your efforts today and I'm humbled to be part of this seminar. Uh, the Tatler family will continue to support such efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Rajbandi. So now I would uh, give the formal vote of thanks. So I would uh, begin by thanking Professor Gurharpalji for uh, sparing his time to be with us. I would also like to thank Professor Dazanbari 
who has been a continuous support for us also here in Punjab. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Arvind, Vice Chancellor of Punjabi University, who is always there to encourage us. I would uh, like to thank uh, Rajvan Tatla ji, who is, you know, took some time out from his busy schedule and uh, is is, uh, is 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 now with us. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Professor Gurmukh Singh ji, Director, Centre for Diaspora Studies, who has been uh, with me uh, in this long journey. And uh, not the least, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Darshan Singh Tatla Memorial Trust for their support uh, for in, in, in the organization of this lecture. Thanks, everyone.